Carlo. I was wondering what you're doing. I'm looking at this little box. I found this box of family memorabilia. And uh, there are interesting things in it. There's a, a spur. One of my ancestors was a cavalry man in the First World War. There's my grandfather's First World War medals. There's this curious little thing. It's, it belonged to my father when he was a child, and it's a food scraper. The child scraped food on its plate like that. And this one is shaped like one of the Queen's guards. And then I found this curious thing. Have a look, Marlowe. A little man. Yes, made of twigs. Now, one of my ancestors uh, travelled to Haiti and he brought this back with him. Um, he said it was a kind of voodoo doll, uh, that it was haunted, and that with the right incantation it will come to life. Shall I try? Go on then. Esprit de poupée en bois, c'est l'heure de te réveiller. Réveille-toi. Lève-toi. No strings attached. Just like that. By Jove, how do you do that? It wasn't me, Marlowe. It was the spirit world. Give me that doll. I'm not giving you the doll. I know you. You'll chew it up. Oh, it's just one of your magic tricks again. Maybe. Quite spiffing, though, I must say. Do you believe in ghosts, Marlowe? We once watched a film together called Ghost Dog, remember? No, I don't. I'm afraid every day I remember less and less about more and more. A Jim Jarmusch film. Is that so? Much as I adored Stranger Than Paradise, Down By Law and Dead Man, I couldn't get on with Ghost Dog. Why not? No ghosts in it and no dogs. Is that so? It breached the Trade Descriptions Act. Well, the title must have meant something else, sir. But Jim Jarmusch aside, do you believe in ghosts? I'm a dog. I live in the moment. Very wise, Marlowe. But do you secretly hope there's a doggy heaven somewhere, a sort of happy hunting ground for dogs in the afterlife? And dogs and their masters, I should say. I'm dashed if I do. Why so? My life here is doggy heaven. It's quite enough for me. Well said, my friend. I can ask the fairies at the bottom of the garden, if you like. There are fairies at the bottom of the garden? I'm pulling your leg. Goodness me, Marlowe. I nearly fell for that one. You are charmingly ingenuous at times. But on the subject of ghosts, uh, personally I've never seen a ghost, but a lot of people say they have. And um, I wanted to remind you, do you remember just before lockdown, our last big walk, we went for a walk with Geraldine. It was a dark, rainy day. We went from the village of Saint-Germain, and we started by the church, and next to the church, or just near the church, there's a presbytery. But I've been reading this book, written by my friend Bernard, Eni Montouraine, and he tells the story of this presbytery, which in 1700 was actually haunted by a poltergeist. I say, how jolly. Do tell. Well, the story goes that in the spring of 1700, there was a priest living there, called Brissot, and he had a valet, and he had a servant lady, and uh, he received students, pupils, to learn Latin in his presbytery. And um, for the Feast of the Ascension, he invited two female cousins to come to visit him from the city. Now, they were very young, beautiful, elegant city girls, with nice clothes and good manners, in rather stark contrast to the, to the contrast to the peasants of uh, Saint-Germain. And um, they arrived, and on the Feast of the Ascension, the, the priest, Brissot, went to the church to do his service, and the girls said that they would come later because they couldn't find their, their necklaces. So they turned up, and the, the mass took place. They returned to the house to find some curious transformations, Things had been taken out of cupboards and chests and placed on the floor. Uh, bedding, clothes, crockery, anything. 
as if someone was preparing to move house. And nothing had been stolen, it was not a burglary, but they found the beads from the missing necklaces in the fire, where a fire had been burning. Well, this mystified them, and they put everything back in its place. And then, in the evening, um, after Vespers, they came back yet again. The priest had taken the precaution of locking the house up so that nobody could get in. They came back and sat down, and immediately, Bedlam, uh, a madhouse, broke out. Plates started falling to the floor, then crashing th through the air and crashing against the walls. Jugs, earthenware jugs. Things were breaking and smashing and uh, all around them in a kind of poltergeist fury. And everyone cowered in the corner trying to protect themselves from this. But the priest, being a priest, gathered his wits about him and uh, decided that there was diabolic work at play. He dressed in his surplus, he fetched some holy water, and he began what was effectively an exorcism. And progressively, the poltergeist calmed down until all appeared to be well. But it was not, because the following day, uh, bedlam broke out again. Things were breaking. Nobody could stay in the house. It was so crazy. So there was nothing for it but to send the two cousins back to their urban uh, homes, which they did. This played on the mind of the priest for a long time, and to test his theory that it was actually the girls who had somehow provoked this poltergeist, he invited one of the cousins back the two months later. Now, as soon as he'd sent the invitation, um, the poltergeist activity began again, and he saw no alternative but to cancel the invitation, and when he cancelled it, the poltergeist calmed down. So the priest was forced to conclude that this poltergeist was either a jealous female ghost or a misogynistic male ghost. Impossible to say. How do we know this story? Because the priest himself wrote it all down. So there we go, Marlow, the story of the haunted presbytery at Saint-Germain which we can see in our little film. Shall we watch the film now, Marlowe? Yes, let's. Toodle-pip, everybody.